Welcome to lecture 12 on uh, module 5 for the subject ARM microcontroller and embedded systems. Subject code is 15EC or 17EC62. So in the previous lecture, we discussed about one of the task synchronization issue, which is dead uh, deadlock. Okay. So another task synchronization issue is racing. So we saw that if there is no task synchronization, so these are the uh, two possible scenarios that will take place. One is racing and one more is deadlock. So there are other scenarios also, but we'll stick on to your syllabus, which will concentrate on racing and deadlock. That's all. So synchronization, as I told in the previous video, is necessary whenever a resource is being shared. Okay, whenever a resource is being shared among one or sorry, among multiple processes and we saw that if uh, more than one process tries to access a shared resource so in the case of racing it was a shared memory location so if more than one process tries to acquire the resource the location and tries to read it and modify it so you may end up with wrong results. So that is what we saw in racing condition. So instead of getting a total value of six for the counter variable, we ended up with five. So if you remember that example. So that is what will happen. So in order to avoid such situations, so the OS, the operating system kernel, will have certain task synchronization or process synchronization techniques. Okay. So we shall uh, discuss about one of the techniques used in task synchronization. Again, there are many techniques used in task synchronization. We will discuss only one so which is uh, there for your syllabus. So, before that, we shall see why task synchronization is necessary. So, task synchronization is necessary or essential for first one is avoiding conflicts in resource access in multitasking environments. So, which will lead to as I told, racing, deadlock, starvation, live lock. So these are other you can say scenarios that arise if there is no task synchronization. Apart from racing and deadlock, these are the other issues that will arise: starvation and live lock. So we shall not discuss them since they are not there. The, not there for the syllabus. So first thing task synchronization does is avoid conflicts when whenever a resource is being accessed by multiple processes. So I also gave the example of a two-wheeler that you need to access and there are two persons who want to access that oh, single two-wheeler. So if, if you want to use the single two-wheeler, so there should be, uh, there should not be conflict there. So one person has to communicate to the other person that, yeah, I'll be using the two-wheeler for so and so time or so many uh, hours like that. And then after that, the other person will get the chance to use the two-wheeler. So that is what is a conflict. There should not be any conflicts. So next use of task synchronization is ensuring proper sequence of operation across processes. So proper sequence of operation across processes. What do you mean by that? So I'll give an example. So there's sequence means, so as you know, it is one after the other. So there will be some processes which have to, uh, which have to be completed one after the other. So before the other uh, completes, before the other process completes, the next process should not start its operation. So I'll give an example for that. So suppose these are the two processes, so P1 and P2. Okay. So the sequence is after P1 completes, so it will dump its uh, whatever the results to this location. Let's say this is a memory location. So say it will have an address. So it is a shared resource now. So once P1 completes, it will dump its result to this memory location. And after that, these contents will be made use by P2 to uh, do some operation or to complete itself. Okay, so this is the sequence. P1 has to first complete, then it will dump the results to this shared location. And these results will be used by one more process P2 to complete its operation. So the sequence here is P1 first has to complete and then only P2 has to access this location. So what will happen if P2 access this, accesses this memory location, 
before P1 completes. So then what will happen is P2 will read some junk value that is present in this memory location. So that junk value may not be proper values that P2 requires. Why? Because P2 has to read this location only after P1 completes. Okay. So how this is done? So how will P2 come to know that P1 has completed? So there should be some synchronization signal between P1 and P2 saying that P1 it will signal P2 that yeah, so I have completed and I have dumped the result to this shared location. So it will send a signal to P2 saying that P1 I have, I have completed. Now you can access the shared location so that you will get the proper values. So that is what we mean by ensuring proper sequence of operation across processes. Yes, same thing is explained here. So whatever this example, it is also known as producer consumer problem. So wherein one process produces some data which is available in the location and this P2 is this next process which will consume this data that is uh, produced in this location. So this is what producer consumer. So once producer produces then only the consumer should access that data. So until producer produces P, uh, this consumer should not access the data. So if it access the data it will get a wrong data or some junk data. So next use of task synchronization is communicating between processes. So this is also uh, one of the you can say need for task synchronization. Yeah, so to in order to implement these or in order to uh, ensure avoiding conflicts, ensure proper sequence of operation and communicating between processes, there are various task synchronization techniques. Okay, so one we will discuss only one of the task synchronization techniques which is sleep and wake okay sleep and wake up so this technique will discuss so in order to synchronize the access to a shared resource the access to critical section should be exclusive so what do you mean by this the access to critical section should be exclusive so critical section means should be a piece of a code which will access uh, the shared resource and you can, it can even modify the shared resource. So we shall go back to this racing condition. So wherein uh, this part that is these three instructions which is nothing but the uh, you can say the assembly equivalent of counter plus plus instruction. These three instructions they become the critical section. Why? Because they are accessing the shared resource. So these three instructions are accessing the shared resource and they even may modify the shared resource in this case it is a memory location so such piece of code so it's a it's such a it's a piece of code or it's a it's a few instructions it's a few instructions which will access the shared resource so such in such instructions or such uh, you can say uh, sequence of instructions are known as critical section. So, to avoid conflicts, so such critical sections should be exclusive. So, what do you mean by exclusive means? You see here, process A and process B both are trying to access this counter variable. So, hence, both are having the same set of instructions which will access the counter as well as increment it. Right? So, such section, such critical section should be exclusive. What do you, what do you mean by exclusive means? See, once a process in this case process A enters the critical section okay and even though this process is let's say preempted the other process which wants to access the same section should not be allowed to access this same critical section why because the, the same section is already being utilized by this process which is currently waiting for its time to get the CPU. Okay, hope you are getting so since this process has already entered the critical section no other process which wants to enter the same critical section should be allowed to access the critical section unless this previous process which has already entered or which first entered the critical section completes so once it completes then process b can be given the access to the same critical section so that whatever the you can say the um, uh, the wrong result that will arise because of this racing condition can be 
eliminated. So that is what he says by exclusive. So once a process is given the chance to access the critical section or enters the critical section, it should be exclusive. So that is no other process. So in this case, process B should not be given this chance to access the same critical section. So and that is what we mean by exclusive access. This exclusive access can be implemented through busy waiting or spin lock and one more thing is sleep and wake up. These are the two task synchronization mechanisms. So out of which we will discuss the second one which is sleep and wake. So what do you mean by sleep and wake mechanism? So sleep and wake mechanism what will happen is when a process is not allowed to access the critical section which is currently being locked by another process. So the process undergoes sleep and enters blocked state. Okay, so what will happen if I go back to this example here? The, as soon as process A enters the critical section, okay, process A enters the critical section. So here it will enter the critical section. What it will do is it will block the access to the shared resource. So it will block the access to the shared resource in this case the memory location so it will, it will block the memory location so that even though it is preempted at some point in between this critical section and next some other process tries to access tries to access the same critical section will not be allowed to access the critical section why because this process which has which is currently utilizing the shared resource has blocked the shared resource so the process which tries to access this shared resource which is currently being blocked by some other resource some other process already so this process which has tried to access that critical resource or critical section which is already being used by some other process this process will enter the sleep state okay so sleep state means it will enter the blocked state so remember the chain of states or the process life cycle. Okay, so we're in so there is a blocked state. Okay, so there is a blocked state. So if you remember here, it's a blocked state. Okay, so this is what will happen for process. This will also happen to the process B, which is trying to access a critical section, which is already being accessed by some other process. Okay, so that is what is given here. So the process which is blocked on waiting for access to critical section is awakened by the process which is current which currently owns the critical section okay so then what will happen so since it tries to access a critical section which is already in use by some other process this process enters the blocked state or sleep sleep state so once it will go to sleep state so it will be awakened by process a only Okay, so when it will be awakened, when, when process B will be awakened by process A, whenever process A complete completes its critical section, okay, so process A will awake will awake the process B. So it will go and awake the process B saying that yeah, my job is done in the critical section. You wake up and you can now access the critical section. Okay, so this is what will happen. The process which wants the critical sense section sends up wake up message to the process which is sleeping as a result of waiting for access to the critical section when the process leaves the critical section so that is what i told so the process here will send a wake up signal to process b once this critical section completes so then process b can utilize the critical section So this sleep and wake can be implemented again in multiple ways. So the, uh, the ways are one is uh, simple uh, way is semaphore. So in semaphore there are three types. So binary semaphore, counting semaphore and one more is mutually mutually exclusive semaphore. So these are the three ways to implement sleep and wake task synchronization. Uh, we can say uh, technique. So semaphore, what is semaphore? It is a nothing but a system resource. And a process which wants to access the 
shared resource first acquire this system object to indicate the other processes that the shared resource is currently is in use by it okay so what do you mean by this simple i'll give a simple example so let's say some process wants to access a resource so let's say this is the resource so this is r1 so let's say this r1 is inside a room okay so inside a room which has a door so this is the door so some process now let's say this is process 1 wants to access this resource r1 okay so how will it access this resource r1 it has to first access the key okay it has to first access the key for this door okay so once it will get the key for this door so then only using this key it can open this door and go and access the resource r1 okay getting this so any process which wants to access resource r1 has to get the access to this key so once it gets the access to this key it can open this door and go inside the room and access the resource getting what i'm saying so this key in this example is nothing but the semaphore Okay, hope you got the concept. This key is known as semaphore. So that is what is told in this first paragraph. So semaphore is a system resource. So this key is a system resource. And a process which wants to access a shared resource, in this case P1, which wants to access R1, okay, first should acquire this system resource, which is the semaphore or the key. So P1 first should access the semaphore. So once it accesses the semaphore or the key, so then uh, this key will be allocated to this p1 so once this key is allocated to this p1 so let's say some other process p2 which wants to access r1 again which is shared resource so it will try to access this key but it will not be given the key why because this key is already with p1 so once a process acquires the key or the semaphore it will be allocated to that process and no other process will be allocated the semaphore. So by acquiring the key, the process is saying that I am utilizing this shared resource until this key is with me. Okay. So once this resource utilization is done, okay, it, it completes P1 completes the use utilization of R1, so it will return the key back to the OS so that this key becomes available now. So once this key becomes available, this key will be given to the next process which has requested the key. So whoever, whichever process has the key or the semaphore can access the resource. So if, if that key is not available, the process the process cannot access the resource. So this is the simple concept. So resources which are shared among a process can either uh, be for exclusive use or for a number of processes at a time. So See, there are some resources which are for exclusive use example so the monitor or let's say the display device in the embedded system the display device usually will be a lcd screen let's say. so that lcd screen should be given exclusive access so what do you mean by exclusive access only one process can utilize the screen and it, it can display something okay so yesterday we saw the example that if two processes are given to access the screen simultaneously, so the whatever the screen will display may give a wrong interpretation. So the example I took was, so the shop is open and next uh, next uh, message was just closed. So instead of displaying shop is open, it may display shop is and then closed. So that is a wrong information. So a, a, dip, a display monitor is a typical example for you can say exclusive access so that is what is said here so and there are certain uh, resources which can be accessed uh, simultaneously by more than one process so example for that is the memory or the, or the secondary memory in your pc or laptop which is the hard disk okay so this hard disk uh, can be read simultaneously by a limited number of processor <clears throat> so more than one process can 
simultaneously use the hard disk to give fetch some information. Okay. So semaphores, as I told, there are three types: binary, counting, and mutual exclusion. So we shall concentrate only on these two: binary and counting. Okay. So what do you mean by binary? So again, I'll go back to this key and door example. So this is what is quoted here. You can see here. So there is a key uh, to this uh, door. Okay, so inside this door, there will be a shared resource. So to access this shared resource, whichever process wants to access this shared resource first has to obtain this key. Okay, so once this process obtains this key, it can open this door and access the shared resource. Okay. So if the key is available, so the process will be given access to this door and it will be given access to the resource. If the key is not available, that means, what do you mean by that? Since the key is not available, that means the key is already with some other process. So the process which wants to access this key has to wait. So that is what is given here. See here. So if this rule, so this process which wants to access this resource first checks whether the key is available. Okay. So it will check whether the key is available. If the key is available, so what will happen? The key will be given access to process A and with this key, you can see here, the process can occupy the room. That means it can go inside the room and access the shared resource okay, if the key is available. So what if the key is not available? Then see, a, a message will be given. So room key is not available. Book and wait till it is available. So book and wait means this process will enter the sleep state or block state if this key is not available until this key becomes available it process here will become uh, blocked or sleep it will go to sleep state so let's say the key is available so process here will be checking for the key and once the key is available it will acquire this shared resource and once it completes the use of the shared resource what will happen is this process will close the door and lock the key and it will return the key so here vacating the room return the key notify the availability to other users so this key will be returned back here okay so that this key can be given to some other process which wants to access the shared resource okay so this is the simple concept of uh, binary semaphore why it is known as binary semaphore because so there is only one key okay there is only one key if the key is available, let's say the state is 1, and if the key is not available, the state is 0. So that is why it is known as binary semaphore. So if the key is available, state is 1. If the key is not available, state is 0. So that is why it is known as binary semaphore. So that is what is discussed here. Implements, so it will implement exclusive access. Exclusive access means only one resource, sorry, one process can access the shared resource at a given point of time. Multiple resources sorry processes cannot access the resource at a time so it will give exclusive access by allocating the resource to single process at a time so single process at a time and not allowing other processes to access it when it is being used by a process so that is implemented using a key for the door so only one process thread can own a binary semaphore at a time because there is only one key and one key can be won by one process so state of binary semaphore object, so as I told, state can be 1 or 0. So this state is uh, implemented or uh, sorry, told in a, in a way that signaled or unsignaled or you can say non-signaled. So the state can be signaled or non-signaled. So the state is signaled when, when it is not owned by any processor thread. Okay, so the state of this binary semaphore or the key state of this key or the binary semaphore is said to be signaled if if it is not owned by any process if it is not owned by any process means if the key is free if the key is free that means no process is holding the key so that state is known as signaled state okay and if the key is already owned by some other process or if the key is already allocated to some process then that key is said to be in non signaled state when it is owned by some process so these are the two states signaled 
for non signal which is nothing but available or not available okay so this binary semaphore is also also known as mutex semaphore mutually exclusive semaphore okay so this is about the binary semaphore so next is counting semaphore so again same concept as semaphore but see the diagram here compare this diagram to the previous diagram you can see here there are multiple keys okay there are there is no single key but there are multiple keys so what will happen in this scenario so if there are multiple keys so more than one process can make use of the shared resource so provided it has the key getting what i'm saying so this is not exclusive access but uh, more than one process or a limited number of processes can use uh, can make use of the shared resource at, at a given point of time so it is just like using the memory as i told secondary memory the hard disk so the hard, hard disk can be read by more than one process at a time so that is what this will do okay so what it will do here is by counting semaphore limits the use of resource by fixed number of Processes or threads. So there is a limitation. There is an upper limitation. So in this diagram, what is the upper limitation? So how many keys are there? One, two, and three. So the upper limitation is three. So at a given point of time, maximum three processes can make use of this shared source. Okay, that is what we mean by an upper limit. So counting semaphore maintains count between zero and maximum value. So in this case, so zero to Three, so the maximum value is three. Okay, so it is uh, minimum value is zero, no keys. Maximum value is three, so that means three keys available. Okay, so counting sum of limits usage of resource to maximum value of the count supported. In this case, three resource, three processes can make use of the resource. So the count associated with sum of object is decremented by one when process acquires it. And count is incremented by one when the when the semaphore object is released. So what do you mean by that? So there are three keys. Let's say process A wants to access the shared resource. It will acquire one key. Okay. So it will give you will give the key to process A. So then what what you have to do? So how many keys will be left then? So it will be three, which is the maximum count minus one. So that is what you mean by that. Whenever you allocate a key or allocate a semaphore object. To a process, you have to decrement the count by one. Okay. So next, available keys will be only two. And whenever a process uh, completes its uh, resource usage and it will uh, move out of the shared resource, so it will return back the acquired key. So then it will be increment by one. So because it is returning back the key, so two will become three now. Is within this process completes the use of this shared resource. So that is what you mean by increment and decrement the uh, semaphore object. Okay. So again, the states can be signaled or non-signaled. So the state will be signaled when count is greater than zero. That means if the keys are available, sort of three. If, if any one key is also available, so that means the state of the semaphore object will be signaled and out of the three keys, if all the three keys are not available, if they are already allocated to some process, so some three processes, so there are zero keys available, then the state of the object is, the state of the semaphore object is non-signaled. Okay. okay. So, just go through this exclusive semaphore, so it is simple. Okay. Just a explanation, as I told, we will concentrate on uh, binary and counting. So that's all for this uh, lecture. So we shall discuss about how to choose an RTOS in the next lecture. Thank you.